Welcome back to a very special, historic episode of Space This Week. Starliner carried crew to the ISS, Falcon 9 remained unstoppable with three launches of Starlink, Rocket Lab completed NASA's pre-fire constellation, and much, much more. Today's episode was sponsored by Ground News, the number one way to take control over the news you read. Go to ground.news slash to check them out. Oh, and uh, Starship made it to space, <laughs> and then successfully re-entered, staying in mostly one piece, and then managed to not only make it through re-entry, but then execute its landing burn to land in the ocean. Not only this, but before all of that took place, Super Heavy successfully separated from Starship, dropped its hot stage ring, and performed a successful splashdown in the Gulf of Mexico. But did everything in the flight go to plan, or did the vehicle fail to hit certain objectives? How about that engine shutdown? Let's dive into it in today's episode of Space This Week. So yes, you've all heard by now, Starship's fourth integrated flight test on the 6th of June last week was a breathtaking and groundbreaking success. SpaceX's Starship is the world's most powerful rocket, and this particular launch featured Ship 29 as the upper stage and Super Heavy Booster 11 for the first stage. So far, in no previous flight test had the booster managed to successfully soft land itself as planned, nor had the Starship upper stage successfully made orbit and survived re-entry. But for this flight, we were hoping things would be different. The main goals here were to have the Super Heavy booster perform a soft landing in the Gulf of Mexico at a virtual tower location, and for the Starship to survive peak heating during atmospheric re-entry. And well, both of these goals were smashed. Breaking down the flight, things began at liftoff, duh, right, <laughs> with all 33 Raptor 2 engines igniting on Super Heavy, propelling the massive vehicle into the air. However, almost immediately, one of the 33 engines shut down, meaning that for the majority of the ascent, only 32 were burning. This is okay though, Super Heavy is designed with redundancy in mind with its multiple engine design, so it can afford to have more than one engine fail without necessarily being compromised. The next milestone to reach was Max Q, aka maximum aerodynamic pressure, aka the moment of peak mechanical stress on the rocket, which it successfully passed through, and we then saw further success with the shutdown of the booster's main engines and the Starship engine ignition and hot stage separation. Now, so far, while amazing to see, all of these milestones had already been completed on Starship's second and third flight tests. The next step, boost back and successful landing of Super Heavy, had never been achieved before, with Flight 2's booster self-destructing basically immediately, and Flight 3's failing to successfully kill its velocity before impact with the Gulf. Now, to reduce mass during the descent, the hot stage ring in Flight 4 was jettisoned, meaning that in this configuration, Starship isn't fully reusable, but this is only a temporary change. Future Super Heavies won't do this, and they will feature a lighter, redesigned hot stage ring that won't jettison. Boost back burn was a success, and then the landing burn began. Here, we saw another partial failure in that only 12 of the 13 landing engines successfully ignited, but again, this is okay thanks to Starship's engine redundancies. It was then that the booster successfully killed its velocity entirely, coming to a soft rest on the surface of the ocean at the virtual tower location. And this is very, very, very significant when it comes to what to expect from Starship Flight Test 5. As you may be aware, Elon Musk has stated that if Flight 4 Super Heavy successfully makes splashdown, which we now know it did, then SpaceX would plan to try and catch the Super Heavy from the air using the chopsticks at the real tower location. So. Will they? The apparent answer is yes. Elon did a stream on X and spilled the beans on a lot of juicy information about not just Flight 4, but what to expect from Flight 5. Now, big thanks to user See You on Mars for capturing this information. Elon stated that the chance of having both the booster and ship soft land was only about 20%. I think that, that was sort of like a 20% lucky outcome because uh, both the booster. Uh, it has to have soft landing and the ship had a soft landing in the ocean. So Flight 4 beat some pretty tough odds there, but I feel like the odds of successful tower catch must be pretty low, but how low? 
Well, actually, Elon estimated a 50% success chance of Tower Catch. The Super Heavy will descend with an impact zone in the ocean, and at the last stages of landing, if it detects no problems, then it will course correct towards the tower for a hopeful Mechazilla catch. Or if it detects any anomalies, then it'll dump itself in the ocean instead. I think Mechazilla's got a decent chance of catching the rocket. Probably, I don't know, 50% chance. If the booster detects that anything's wrong, it'll set itself into the ocean. Honestly, a tower catch will be absolutely insane to watch, so I can't wait to see it happen. Elon also shared some information about the Starship upper stage, but I will get to that in a second. I should mention that I always try and be as politically neutral about Elon as I can be in these videos, as I find that a lot of articles about SpaceX can often be very politically driven, largely because of Elon, who dragged the entire car industry kicking and screaming towards electric with Tesla, and revolutionized the space industry with reusable rockets, all things popular with the left, but at the same time he does hold a lot of right-wing political beliefs, frequently promoting these on X, making him also popular with the right. Naturally, we therefore do get a lot of stories about SpaceX and Musk from both sides of the political spectrum, and with underlying political biases and sensationalisms muddying the waters, it can be hard to know how reliable the reporting can be. And that's what today's sponsor, Ground News, sets out to address. Ground News was created by a former NASA engineer, and it's your beacon of clarity in a sea of noise. It provides a visual breakdown of each story, revealing the reporting outlets, their owners, what their political biases are, and the factual accuracy of their sources. They also have the blind spot feed, which is a unique feature that uncovers stories overlooked by one side of the political spectrum. Ground News surface 20 blind spot stories per day. Taking a look at this article about SpaceX's Star Shield deployment, which is the military equivalent of their civilian Starlink program, and looking at Ground News' bias distribution, it's a pretty even split between left-leaning, right-leaning, and center news sources. You can see how each side of the spectrum is reporting on things by clicking each of these three tabs, and for a very quick breakdown, Ground News has an AI-powered bias comparison tab. Clicking this reveals that the left delivers more information about the subject itself and its potential impacts and controversies, while the right is more emotive on the subject and places more focus on personal admiration for Elon Musk, deviating from the factual focus from the left and centre. Ground News' mission to make the media landscape more transparent is something I can really get behind. To eliminate the risk of being biased themselves by relying on advertisers, they are entirely subscriber funded. If you want to get behind what they do, then look no further than my link just for you. Go to ground.news slash to get 40% off their unlimited access vantage plan for just $5 a month. This plan provides total access to every feature mentioned in this video and more. Thank you so much to Ground News for sponsoring this video. Now, let's recap the amazing journey that Ship 29 undertook. While Super Heavy was busy smashing expectations, Ship 29 successfully reached engine cutoff, coasting through space. And then, it was time for re-entry. Now, Ship 28 had already set the bar pretty high on Flight 3, sending incredible views of the re-entry plasma, but ultimately, it was in a bit of an unrecoverable death roll during all of this, and it was ultimately destroyed at hypersonic speeds. But this time, Ship 29 hit the atmosphere at the right orientation, thanks to the implementation of more attitude control thrusters, and the re-entry was controlled. As the vehicle descended through, we did start seeing some damage occur in the form of the flaps taking on some uh, rather visible damage from the extreme heat, which then ended up splattering and cracking the camera lens, with the stainless steel becoming molten in places. As I watched the live stream, I honestly was expecting the vehicle to eventually succumb to the heating, but no, Starship survived. We saw it first become transonic, then subsonic, and then, right before impact with the ocean, the three central sea level Raptor engines ignited, and despite the damage sustained by the flaps, we can just about see them actuate for the final landing flip, and as you can see from the orientation indicator at the bottom, Ship 29 flipped itself vertical and soft landed in the ocean, which you can see for a very brief second there before the feed cut. Now, one slight failure here was the fact that the ship had splashed down six kilometers off 
target, but considering that its only main expectation was to just survive re-entry in one piece, I'd say that this was only a minor dent in an otherwise exceptional flight. Obviously, this vehicle isn't going to be reusable if the flaps just melt like that, but SpaceX are apparently already on the case with this. During Elon's stream, he stated this. Next launch, uh, Starship launch, launch is probably in about a month. Uh, we, we have to take... We're, we're, we're going to replace the whole heat shield on the ship. So the new uh, heat shield uh, tile uh, is about twice as strong as the ones that were on the last flight. So, um... And we want to put... Uh, and a, an ablative secondary structure, like basically ablative protection behind the tile, so that if a tile cracks or comes loose, it doesn't cook the rocket. Um, ablative. It's, it's, it's not good for reuse, but it's good for uh, saving your butt if, if um, a tile cracks or falls off. So yes, the entire heat shield will be replaced with one that is twice as strong, although I imagine Elon meant to say twice as heat resilient, and there will be an ablative underlayer for the tiles as well. Presumably, this will mean that Ship 30 is going to need significant refurbishment, so it may be a while before the next flight. The ship has already conducted a static fire at the now demolished suborbital pad B, so it is otherwise ready for Flight 5. Elon estimates the next flight could be as early as one month, though we do have to bear in mind that he does have somewhat of a reputation about overestimating timelines. I'd say we're probably at least a couple of months away at best, but I would love to be proven wrong there. Speaking of Ship 30's static fire, the reason that suborbital pad B was demolished was because SpaceX has now moved static fire testing, at least for starships, to the Macy's site. And we saw the first use of the static fire stand here with a successful test from Ship 26. I don't know why Ship 26 is still here. I can't imagine it's going to be used for a flight at this point. So it was probably used here because SpaceX didn't want to test the brand new static fire stand with a flight article in case something went wrong that resulted in damage to the vehicle. Now, in addition to Starship, SpaceX also managed to pull off three successful Falcon 9 launches last week, all of these being Starlink missions and all successful. The first was on the 5th of June, while the other two were both on the 8th, one of which was the first launch to Starlink Shell 10. Oh yes, and we also saw the successful launch of Boeing's Starliner. Sadly, somewhat overshadowed by the Starship hype, but still a historic mission in its own right. Starliner has faced many delays and technical issues, but last week it finally launched astronauts Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams to the International Space Station atop a United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket, marking the first crewed launch from Cape Canaveral Space Launch Complex 41 since Apollo 7 in 1968. This also marked the 100th Atlas V launch and the first time the rocket has carried humans. After reaching orbit, during their coast to the ISS, Butch and Sunny performed several manual maneuvering exercises. Unfortunately, flight controllers detected two helium leaks in different parts of the spacecraft's propulsion systems, therefore temporarily closing two helium manifolds to manage this. Despite this, the spacecraft had enough control to complete its rendezvous with the station, docking with the Harmony module 27 hours after launch, delayed by over an hour due to issues with the reaction control thrusters. It's expected to remain docked for the remainder of this week, and return to Earth is expected no earlier than the 18th of June. Blue Origin recently returned to flying paying customers to the edge of space, and their only real competitor, Virgin Galactic, did the same last week. Galactic 07 saw Spaceship 2 reach an apogee of 87 and a half kilometers above the Earth after separating from its carrier aircraft, carrying four tourists, including Tuva Ataseva, the second Turkish person ever to go to space, on a suborbital trajectory. The space plane made a successful landing, and what will likely be its final ever landing. Virgin Galactic retired the space plane after this mission, as it looks ahead to its next generation Delta class space planes. How ready the Delta class is remains to be seen, but I am looking forward to seeing what Virgin Galactic have to show for us next. Rocket Lab saw success with its pre-fire and ice launch last Wednesday. The Electron rocket carried the second pair of satellites for NASA's pre-fire mission to Earth orbit, having launched the first pair successfully a couple of weeks ago. Pre-fire stands for Polar Radiant Energy in the Far Infrared Experiment, 
and the four satellites will work together to measure a little studied portion of the radiant energy emitted by Earth for clues about sea ice loss, ice sheet melting, and the warming of the Arctic, crisscrossing over the Arctic and Antarctic, measuring thermal infrared radiation. The Blunderbirds were back in action last Saturday. Going full steam ahead in our revert to KSP1, I decided to revive a classic series on this channel where I rescue other players' stranded missions, and I was moved by Redditor Skefson's stranded mun landing and stranded rescue attempt. <laughs> this was a really fun mission, because not only did I have to ferry four kerbals from the surface of the mun, I also had to do it with only a partially unlocked tech tree, because Skefson was playing in science mode. If that sounds like a fun time, then that's because it was, and if you want to watch it, it should statistically be one of the video cards now available to click on screen screen. I also have a Patreon and YouTube member page you can join to help support what I do here. And of course, big thanks again to Ground News for sponsoring today's video. Go to ground.news slash to check them out. And lastly, thank you for watching today's video. I hope you enjoyed the ride and I'll see you in the next one.